What's up, PhD friends? Today I'm interviewing Dr. Mansi Kakanis, who is a medical science liaison. All right, so for all of you who have been waiting for the episode with an MSL, a medical science liaison, this episode is for you. Now, before we jump into the episode, I do want to tell you about the courses I have available here at the Bull PhD. If you go to this link right here, you should be able to explore the different courses I have on writing and building a personal brand that really launches your non-academic career so make sure to check that out and also please like this video please comment please share it really does help with telling the YouTube algorithm that these are viable videos that they should share out more so please do that for us let's jump right into the interview welcome Mansi. I'm super excited to have you you are my first medical science liaison on the board PhD tell us a little bit about yourself Thank you so much. And it's always great to be the first in something. So I'm very excited. And before I introduce myself, I want to thank you for doing this because this is such a great resource for students and for anyone who is looking to make a move from academia to industry. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm currently a medical science liaison in hematology and oncology at Daihong Oncology. And uh, before that, I used to be um, an MSL at Ascentage Pharma, and I've been in the industry for almost uh, nine or 10 months. Um, prior to that, I have um, been in academia for almost 12 and a half years. Um, I did my postdoctoral fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine in molecular and human genetics, and um, I did my PhD in biochemistry at Medical College of Wisconsin. And um, I did my master's um, in India. And then I worked briefly for a year in a cancer research institute in India. So I have been in academia for all of these years. And then I made a jump from academia to industry. Um, my background, um, my strongest strength um, in, in um, uh, academia was my uh, research experience in oncology and then a little bit of molecular neuroscience sort of experience during my postdoc also. Um, but I guess what has helped me to, because that is the most relevant um, part for your podcast, is that what has helped me uh, make this transition is that all the transferable skills that I acquired during um, during my time in academia, rather than all the little technical skills. So I would say that, you know, ha having the ability to build relationships, to connect with people, I think, and, and having that emotional intelligence, I would say, are some of my greatest strengths, um, you know, some that I acquire, some, some where you already have a natural inkling towards something. So I would say it's like a combination of both of those things that, um, you know, have, have helped me in my role as an MSL. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mansi. That that's really helpful that you know you just shared a little bit about your your educational background, which is super rich, right? You 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 know you had you got your PhD in India. You um, followed up with a degree here in the US postdoc, um, and then we're in academia for twelve years. And I want us to maybe talk a little bit about that. What made you after twelve years? That's over a decade. What made you decide? Okay, it's time for me to leave because I think um, one of the reasons I started this this channel and the reason I started this interview series was because I was encountering people who number one didn't know that there were even careers outside of academia and number two they felt stuck in academia but were not really sure what the justification was for them to leave. Um, because when you're in academia, people, a lot of people from the outside see that as a very cushy job, as a very privileged job, as, you know, very respectable job, right? And so, um, but what made you, what, what made you say, I'm, I, you know, I'm stepping away from this, I'm transitioning to something else? Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, all of the things that you said, uh, you know, that's something I can relate to. So um, 
I had been in academia for all these years and I was extremely passionate about, I mean, when you decide to leave your country and come to another country so that you can do better science, that it, that, it, that in itself shows that you're very passionate about doing science and that was my case. And so after being in postdoctoral fellowship uh, towards, uh, you know, towards completing five years there, I realized that, you know, whatever I'm doing here, how, how much of an impact does it have on society? I was doing um, some work in Drosophila genetics. And so by the time, you know, anything from that goes to bedside, um, I'm not saying all of the research being done in academia is is slow or or its impact is, you know, going to happen in five decades or whatever. Um, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying that the work that I was doing was, um, you know, its impact was going to happen after like, I don't know, maybe five, ten decades. I don't know. And I wanted to see something where I'm putting all of this knowledge, everything that I've done in uh, you know, in 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 a way that it's it's more impactful that I see that what I I say is being utilized in some way in the society. And then, secondly, also about my personal interests. After being in academia for so many years, I had seen and done everything that was there um, to do, and um, I didn't have more of. Um, inclination to, you know, spend more time in research or, or identify something new. It, that passion somehow um, had, had gone, you know, that to, to do things in an experimental way, um, you know, do an experiment, find out, uh, you know, what this particular protein does in, in, in the cell. I mean, that kind of um, interest had sort of uh, diminished for me and and great if someone else has it I'm not trying to comment on uh, you know how others feel about it for me personally that kind of passion had gone and um, I don't know maybe it happened because you know the success of experimentation is so so low when you put in like six months of experimentation and then you're like oh this is completely against my hypothesis now I need to <laughs> bring up a new hypothesis because that's how nature works and you know I was sort of uh, done with that kind of creativity where you you do things with experimentation and um, so one was you know my personal interest had changed the second thing was I really wanted to put my knowledge to um, to something that is more impactful, um, and, um, and and then also that um, I was um, into these um, you know I used to go to these career development sessions that used to happen um, at my institution and um, talking to people who were in different fields within the industry that kind of helped me get knowledge about you know what's out there and um and see what where my my likings my passion my personality fits in and that's how i decided that um okay this is time to move <laughs> and then you know starting with applications and everything that kind of takes time because when you're making the move for the first time, it's not always easy. It's going to take time. And mm -hmm. then um, finally, yeah. then make the move. <laughs> Absolutely. No, thank you so much for sharing that. I think one of the things that you, you mentioned was the fact that they, they get there comes a time where you're like everything I want to do in academia I've done you yes know, the experiments I want to do I've done them and that it doesn't hold any more excitement for me and I think you know you saying I that was amongst other things that you just said but that stood out to me because mm -hmm. sometimes people get there and it's like yeah you know I've done this academic thing and 
I've written the papers and I've done all the, it doesn't hold any more excitement for me. And it's okay to get to that point and say, I think I want to shift into something else. And then when you had said that, you know, in academia, sometimes your research doesn't have an impact for decades. You know, that can also be very, very true where you, first of all, if you can get the experiments to work, okay. (laughs) If you can get the experiments to work in, in a decade, (laughs) um, because, (laughs) because, you know, you can be working. People's whole PhD projects are just negative results, right? Um, and, you know, I, one of the things I learned, I used to be so bummed when I'd get negative results until I began to, until I went, I joined a lab where they published negative results. And I was like, okay, you know, they were like, this was our hypothesis. We tested it, it didn't work. And it was a paper, you know? And so negative results are results as well. But you know, that the, the success rate of your experiments, especially in the biomedical sciences, can be, yeah. can be very low and yeah. it can be demoralizing at a point yeah. even. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So now you work as a medical science liaison. Tell us mm-hmm. what that role is. What is a medical science liaison? So a medical science liaison is basically like a bridge between the pharmaceutical industry and the external medical environment. So by external medical environment, I mean all of the healthcare providers and healthcare entities. Um, So an MSL provides information about um, the products of the company, which which may be in different phases of development and um, gives very unbiased, non-promotional, um, unsolicited, um, you know, um, view of of the scientific information uh, related to the the investigation and the drugs of the company, the clinical trials going on um, from that are sponsored by the company, and um, interacts with healthcare providers um, in a way to provide them this um, unbiased, truthful um, scientific information, scientific um, data, medical. Um, data, data from clinical trials um, in an unsolicited, non-promotional way. They also, um, MSLs will also bring insights back from their interaction within the field to, you know, get an idea of what are the unmet needs, how are the, the products being used back to the industry. So that way um, you are sort of like the liaison bridge that is connecting both the, the medical environment and the company so that um, the company can strategize appropriately based on what's happening, um, uh, you know, with, with healthcare providers using products for their patients. And that way you are also able to participate, not directly, but participate in, uh, you know, providing um, or, or helping healthcare providers make the best choice make an informed choice for their patients. Right. Make an informed choice for their patients. Thank you. Thank you. Because that kind of reinforces the idea that I always had about what the work that MSLs did, which was, yes, you are a bridge between, like you said, the medical environment Mm -hmm. and the um, pharmaceutical companies. Right. And so in your role, what would you say on a daily basis, right? I know from, from day to day, things may change, but what would a typical, maybe a typical day or a typical week look like? What activities are you, are you doing? And also earlier on, you talked about transferable skills, right? For somebody that's trying to come, well, maybe that's a whole set of questions. Let's, let's answer the first question first. What does a typical day or a typical week look like for Mansi, the MSL? Um, uh, there is actually when, uh, you know, being an MSL, you don't have a typical day. Every day may look different. Um, most of the days you are um, you are meeting with uh, key opinion leaders. You might have like a calendar full of meetings. Then on, on other days, you know, you are... Um, uh, you are doing some competitive intelligence. You are going to conferences, um, attending, um, you know, what is new in the field, getting that, the picture of what is the therapeutic landscape and, um, you know, bringing all of those insights back. Then there are some days where you are just uh, 
putting together um, everything that you have got from the field, um, organizing your, um, uh, you know, all the insights that you have. You are um, being very much aware of what's going on, what is the latest uh, um, research, um, clinical outcomes that have uh, been published. You are reading up a lot of papers, uh, all of that. So it may look very different from, from day to day. But um, one of the most, I would say, the most important function is to, to interact with key opinion leaders or, um, or, or healthcare providers. So interacting with key opinion leaders. And so um, I, a long time ago, I spoke with an MSL. So this is, I know that this is a key part of your job as, as an MSL. And so for those of you watching that maybe think, what's a key opinion leader? A key opinion leader simply is a physician scientist, a medical researcher who, um, again, is in the medical environment and maybe using these drugs for their patients and also collecting data for clinical research, correct? Yes, that is correct. And so in interacting, so for instance, Mansi, like a question I always have had for MSLs is how do you initiate those relationships? Because um, when, when somebody is new in the role, it's not like the company has a list of KO, well, they may have a list of KOLs that they may work with, but I know that one of your jobs as an MSL may be to initiate these relationships. So obviously your interpersonal skills have to be on point, but uh, for somebody that may be entering this type of role, maybe it's a it's a it's a it's a newer company. Maybe they have to initiate relationships. What would you what what kind of tactics or tips would you give to somebody to initiate these relationships with KOLs if they want to become successful MSLs? On um, on the companies and um, okay, so um, before I say anything, let me just uh, make this uh, announcement that any view that I am sharing right now is my personal view. Yes. In the talk, I am not. Uh, this uh, this does not relate to uh, my current employer or my previous employers. This is just my personal view. Disclaimer. Um, yeah. All of the answers, everything that I discussed today, mm -hmm. is my personal view. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I would say that every company will uh, will give you a basic, uh, you know, uh, uh, some sort of training or an objective, uh, a scientific exchange objective. Mm -hmm. uh, why are you doing this particular meeting? So that way you may have, uh, you know, some kind of, um, let's say the scientific exchange objective, why you are connecting with them. So. Sometimes it's very structured what, what the company will give you as the scientific exchange objective that will help you to approach the uh, healthcare provider. But I think your question more relates to, um, you know, the personality of uh, a person when they are trying to connect with a healthcare provider, as I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I would say that um, just... Um, keeping in mind that everyone is busy, they may not always have time for you, and that um, whatever you present, whatever you talk about is always for the audience. In this case, your audience is your scientific leaders or your key opinion leaders. So you have to keep that in mind. And um, of course, the company's objective, why you are having that meeting, some meetings may be just introductory, others may be to talk about um, the clinical trial going on in the company. So keeping that objective in mind and also being very aware that whatever you present is for your audience, um, I think that will help you in, in presenting yourself properly. And I am I am I answering your question? Or? Uh, you actually are answering the question. Yes. So I think what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that the, the company is not just going to throw you to the sharks. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. They, they're going to have resources that allow you yes. to, that's, that's helpful yes. to know. They're going to have resources that help you structure the conversation you're going yes. to have. They yes. may even have a list of people, may yes. have a list of people that you should talk with yes. and and even if you haven't talked to those people because those people know about your company, then it's not yeah. so weird. So that's that's kind of helpful to, to know that um, because I think that that was one of 
a long time ago when I was interested in becoming an MSO. That was one of the things I was intimidated by because I was like, I'm quite introverted. People always make fun of me because I have a YouTube channel and they're like, but you seem so bubbly. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm bubbly on camera, but I'm quite uh, reserved. Um, <laughs> but you know, that was like, that was the thing that was going to be a challenge for me. It's like, ah, I have to talk to people or I have to, I have to talk to them and form relationships with them, you know? Um, but this is really, really helpful, uh, Mansi, that you are sharing that, it, you know, the company is not going to throw you to the shark. So that's yeah, really, absolutely. Really, really helpful. So for people that want to enter into the MSL career, right? Because one of the things that I, I also notice is that for a lot, well, it's just about any job that's out there. People always want to see that you have some experience. So being in the, in, in the field for, um, for a few years now, what would you give to somebody that is transitioning from academia into this type of role? What should they start, what should they start doing? What should they start putting in place so that they are a, you know, a preferred candidate when they go to interview? Uh, that's a great question. And um, I would suggest for those who are looking to transition to network, network, network. That is the key to, uh, to making a transition. Um, uh, I think many, many people are not harnessing the power of networking. And I think it's one of the most powerful tools when you want to make. A transition so try to build a link linkedin really helps when you're trying to build a network and that does not mean sending those automated requests <laughs> you know just by clicking but by being out there trying to talk with people who are already in the field and trying to you know do informational interviews with them to understand how the MSO role is being uh, conducted in, in different different companies. And, um, uh, you know, that, uh, that will really um, help um, someone who's looking to transition is to network. Is to network. And you, you mentioned LinkedIn as a, as a great platform to network. And so on LinkedIn, people should how would somebody who is so one of the things that I I, I, rec I recommend LinkedIn a lot but right? I, I I'm, I'm very very I'm always selling LinkedIn even though they, they they don't pay me any money but um one of the, the 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 challenges people have sometimes is okay but how do I start networking on LinkedIn um are you having are you are you just reaching out to people cold and having conversations with them what are, what are you doing what are the practical things you can do to network that have helped you i think um when you connect someone on linkedin try to see if they have a couple of minutes to to chat with you that's probably one way to you know um make yourself known to that person rather than just you know being virtually there in the network so um I would do that, uh, and I have done that. Um, um, and then also, when you when you talk to that person, try to get more information about the career that you're looking for. Um, it can be MSL, it can be any other uh, you know field that you are trying to look for. That is like the basic thing that I would suggest um, when you when you try to connect people on LinkedIn. Mm. Yeah, and I think many people like to help. Uh, many people have done a similar kind of transition from academia to industry. And whoever I spoke to was very, very helpful mm. um, on LinkedIn. Some people even did like mock interviews with me mm. you know, just to help me. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful to know. So reach out to people, you know, and one of the yeah. things that I'm always um, sharing with folks is that sometimes what, what, one of the things that has happened to me recently is I've gotten so busy that I can't, I literally cannot take on informational interviews anymore. But there's so many, and I usually tell people that, right? Like, oh, I'm so sorry, I can't get on the phone with you, but maybe here's a resource, right? So if people are not able to meet with you, maybe they say no, but here's a resource. Maybe they say no, maybe they say yes, you know, so, so just be ready that not everybody is going to say yes, not everybody is going to, not everybody, everybody is trying to also live their lives off of the internet. So always remember that when you reach out to somebody, um, there may be yes, they may be no, there may be no with a, with a resource. 
all of it is, is a learning experience and don't get intimidated by any of the responses. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So for I, I love uh, the advice also that you just gave um, about, you know, once you get on these informational interviews, you may even have somebody that's willing to do a mock interview. And I think that's really important because when you go into these interviews, there are certain basic things that I'm pretty sure that they want you to know. They want you to be aware of. Um, I know with for, for MSLs, you have to work on therapeutic areas, right? And so um, for you, you had a lot of um, a background in cancer research and so on. And so it makes sense that you went into hemocology, oncology. And so so uh, hemolo- uh, yeah, hematology, oncology. Anyway, um, so then I was trying to say hemonc, and then I said it hemocology. Anyway, um, so for somebody, and again, going back to somebody that's trying to break into this profession, uh, they've been working on uh, drosophila, right? It's not maybe a specific disease area. How do they define a therapeutic area for themselves? that says, okay, based on the on my background, I have experience in, you know, cardiac disease or um, cancer or, you know, this particular therapeutic area. How can people begin to define that for themselves so that they can kind of target those types of jobs? I think that in that case, it, um, and that's a great question again, it's kind of hard for even the person to, to understand that, oh, what, therapeutic area do I relate to the most because their uh, research is so much into basic science. Mm-hmm. So I would say that try to identify a, if you're working on a pathway, what all is that pathway, um, you know, related to in terms of like a disease indication. Right. And then you can sort of get into one particular. And of course you need to know Um, something about the disease area also like um, if you are working on a on a pathway which is like very broad um, and if you say that I'm um, I'm interested in immunology then make sure that the pathway that you are working on is is in some way connected to that's just my opinion that's how Mm -hmm you would, you know, position yourself, I would say. Right. And that's great advice. And so we think, we think how what you're doing can fit into a specific disease or therapeutic area Mm -hmm. because each of the, uh, each of the, you know, therapeutics or pharmaceutical companies may be working on and that employ MSLs work on specific areas. And so it's it's really important to prove to them that you have knowledge in that area and therefore you are the person to be employed. Well, this has been such a great conversation, Mansi. Before we, we you know, kind of wrap up, are there any resources that you found helpful when you were transitioning from um, academia into, into the pharmaceutical industry? Um, I guess like reading these blogs, um you know, written about how to interview, um, what are the commonly asked questions in interviews. I think that there are lots of blogs um, uh, that that you can look up for. And I think that really will help you to prepare for interview, you know, kind of seeing what are the expectations and how you should prepare yourself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's so really that helpful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that no, that's really helpful. And there was a book I've forgotten the name of the book, but it was called "Breaking into Your First MSL Role." Oh, yes. Um, yes, that was a really good book. I found it way back when. I'm going to link it um, for those of you watching. Yeah. I'll link it in the description. I'll link it um, on the blog as well. But thank you, Mansi. This was such a great conversation. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Thank you so much for having me, and um, I think this is great. Um, I hope that uh, the advice that I gave is helpful. <laughs> it is, it is. And for those people that, you know, want to reach out to Mansi, I'm also going to leave her LinkedIn information so that you can reach out to her and chat with her. Thank you so much, Mansi.